I probably should say something about uh, using flash for macros. Now I have to give a disclaimer. I'm not a big lover of flash, although flash is very, very much used by many uh, close-up and natural photographers, so, so I know that it can be done. Um, yeah, for me, I use flash for, you know, like family snapshots. But for macro and close-up, it's just not for me, and I certainly have tried it. I used flash photography extensively for about a year and a half to do macro photography out in the field. And at the time, I thought I was getting some good stuff. And certainly flash sheds more light on the subject, so to speak. But sometime later, when I started to go back over and really look at what I had produced, I could see, see the earmarks of using flash all over the photos, and it made them pretty much uh, useless for me. Now, now, I know that I need to get back into using flash again, but this time in a much more subtle manner, maybe so gently that you would never know that flash was being used. It's on my list, but for now I'm just you know, pretty happy with, and I'm generally just using natural light unless I'm in a studio, in which case that um, I use different kinds of light including um, fiber, fiber optics. So I will try to find time to do flash outdoors. Now, some cameras, some Nikon ca cameras like the D7000, the D700, the D200, the D100, they come with a built-in flash. Uh, if it's there, you know, it would make sense to try to use it. But onboard flash is really not useful for macro photography because it, it can't be moved anywhere but where it is. And it's just too direct and it's right in your face. Now one thing that I have tried to do with when I use onboard flash is to find some kind of uh, a diffuser. Some people just use like a foam coffee cup that will soften the light. And you know, that actually does help. Or you may be able to build or buy, there's many on the market, some kind of baffle that reflects the light upward, outward, or sideways, somehow that you don't just blast the subject. Most, but mostly what I've used is not internal flash, but what's called, you know, just uh, external flash. And that's the way to go if you want to integrate flash into your close-up and macro work. Flash for focus stacking would require that the unit to flash just one time for every photo layer. So that might require some careful monitoring to keep everything even, not to mention batteries. I've never tried it. I'm really off flash, and I'm, as I mentioned, into natural lighting. But using less flash is better than none. So although I have a bunch of flash units, you know, like um, the SB800, 900, and so on, but I have an old tiny SB400, it's like $200, totally light, weight it uses two AA batteries and it gives me more light than I need and uh, in fact I have a, a bunch of diffusers just to tone that tiny flash down and so on. I also have various uh, arms and other rigs that mount off to the side or mount on the tripod and they wor or work with the hot shoe of my camera to extend the light away from the camera uh, above or to the side. As I mentioned, I have a couple of SB600s and an SB900 and even older flash units. But since I don't really use flash except for snapshots at parties, I don't have much to tell you except that I don't like the effect. You might want to get the classic uh, macro book by John Shaw called Close-Ups in Nature. It covers flash just very thoroughly and is probably the classic book on macro photography. You, you just should have a copy. But I have to take a pass on flash for right now. Let's talk about some of the problem, problems that you're gonna run into when you're stacking focus. One of them is just, quote unquote, the bad frame. You may have included a frame that does not belong to the series of stacks. I do it all the time. It's usually, let me say something about how I take flash and keep track of it of the layers of uh, for any given photograph within the camera. I always put my hand over the lens and take a shot between any two stacks. If I change the lens and use a different lens, then I take 
put my hand over and take two shots so that later in post when I'm looking in Lightroom at it I can see very clearly exactly which uh, what what comprises the series and also when I change lenses and I either write down the lenses I've used or hopefully if I haven't used too many then I can just uh, remember but it's important to kind of keep track of uh, what lenses you've used so that you can learn from your situation. Another helpful thing I do is that when I finally load all of my images, my sets of stacks into Lightroom, and I begin to export the whole mess of them, often hundreds and hundreds of them, out to uh, a directory so they can be picked up by um, my stacking software, which is called Zareen Stacker. While the files are exporting, I take a sheet of paper and a pencil and go back and mark the beginning frame and the end frame from Lightroom on a piece of paper of each stack. So then when I'm loading stuff from this external directory, I know exactly which is the first and the second. And I don't have to look at Windows Explorer to see pictures and try to guess from the pictures. Because remember, I'm stacking from a D800E, so the images that I would be looking at in Windows Explorer are 200 and some megabytes a piece because they're, uh, they've been exported as TIFF files, which is about as large as you can get. And if I were to have to look at a whole page of that, it would take a long time for Windows to go through and open up each small image so I can see. Also, you just make mistakes. So don't make mistakes, but just mark down the beginning frame and the end frame and you'll, you'll do much better. So if you run a stack and look at the result and something's messed up, the most likely thing that you've done is pick up a blank frame or any other frame as part of the series and try, try to run the stack and that just won't work. Another problem we might call it having too many frames. Just because you took 10 or 100 frames, layers, photos of the subject does not mean you need all 10 or whatever number it is uh, in order to have a good photo, especially when the result be has, shows you too many artifacts or some kind of problems. So, so you can try dropping layers. Sometimes you can drop a layer right from in the middle of a stack, like maybe on that one layer, some bug or wind or something moved the subject. You can drop that photo and the stack usually comes out just fine. Um, so anyway, another thing, or you can just shorten that stack and then run the stack again and see what you've got. And often the result can be different enough to save that shot. Now let's talk about minimal frames. Um, you can also just forget about the whole sequence, the whole stack that you have. Go into the layers themselves and find just which layers show that subject into fo in focus just you know to the very best and then use just them or you can uh, go and stack different sections of the sequence so you end up with two or three stack sequences and then stack those and it will come out while if you run the whole stack uh, it just won't work often the result is still better than just taking a single one photo traditional uh, shot Anyway, uh, try merging layers into several sections that look good and then merge the sections, that's the idea. And then run it again. Sometimes if you just run the whole stack again, especially in something like Photoshop, which is like the worst stacker for me, I will get a better result. I have no idea why this is so, but it's worth a try if you love that particular photo. And speaking of just traditional photos, as a last result, I just use a single frame of a stack, although not so great because you know it's, you know, you just have a tiny, tiny, narrow uh, bit of focus there. But forget about stacking. Sometimes, uh, I mean, one virtue of taking bracketed focus shots, focus stacking, is that more often than not, at least one of the frames that you shot, uh, you would have taken if you had only one shot. I mean, you know, just a traditional photo with one point of focus. When all else does not work, usually there may be a single photo within that stack that will do the job. 
Anyway, it's well worth spending at least some time tinkering with the stack before you abandon the shot, especially if it's a photo you really like. And sometimes I've taken one layer out of the stack and it, you know, yeah, it's a little tiny bit of focus, but the whole bokeh, the whole, the rest of it's all bokeh, all out of focus, sometimes in a very beautiful way, better than a crystal clear uh, image of the whole stack in focus, so just a thought. How close is too close? That's a question that you will find yourself answering as you get into focus stacking. Of course, it depends a lot on what lens you're using, but I have found that trying to focus on too tiny a part of a flower generally shows poor results. And let's just take some examples. One of the advantages of traditional one-shot photography is that you don't have any artifacts but unless, the, unless you're photographing a two-dimensional subject like a page from a newspaper, and even then, unless that newspaper is flat and exactly parallel to the plane of the camera's sensor, you're automatically going to have some distortion, which is some perspective. And that perspective puts one area of the photo in focus and throws another, usually the rest of it, somewhat or way out of focus, at least to a degree. And of course, the eternal quest for the holy grail of depth of field by photographers meets with disappointment when at higher apertures, narrower apertures, diffraction sets in and exacts its toll of resolution. So that's the main reason we do focus stacking. Yet focus stacking, as we've pointed out, cannot but fail to capture every bit of a subject because it's a sampling technique, but it can manage often to fail successfully if we're very careful, resulting in a photo that at least has the appearance of real depth of field. And let's not forget landscapes. Focus stacking is probably more successful in enhancing focus in non-close-up shots like mid-range and distant, distant subjects such as landscapes where even adding a little bit more depth of field can dramatically enhance the shot. So by all means, try a few landscape shots. Usually with the landscape shots, you only need to take two or three layers and stack that and you'd be surprised at just the clarity you get. And it's even better in like mini landscape, fairly close-up shots where you can really bring a bush or something into uh, much greater detail just by taking three or four shots and, and, and stacking those. As mentioned earlier, where focus stacking starts to break down most visibly for me is in extreme close-up shots, what we would call micro rather than macro shots, like microscope. When you get this close, you really do need a focusing rail and you need studio lights and all of that. We can get great shots using a rail and micro-stepping the focus along that rail. But for me, this is a whole other kind of photography than, than what's being presented here. Uh, it's a bit of a science, and I, I do a lot of it, but I usually do it in the wintertime in the studio because I can't go outside because it's too cold. Because it's... For example, when shooting a very tiny flower, being so close to a subject shows not only any weakness in the lens that you're using, but also weakness in the technique, particularly if you're doing short stack focusing. By not covering every millimeter of that scene when you're so close, we are opening ourselves up to tiny movements of wind if we're outside, and simply extremes of perspective within the subject matter itself. And the result is that artifacts are more visible up close than, than when we stand back just like some of the French Impressionist painters like Monet or Pissarro are best viewed if you stand back a few feet rather than right up close. The artifacts or artifice is absorbed at a distance, but it's obvious when you're close. And the same goes for focus stacking if it's not uh, rail mounted, if you're not using a focus rail. For myself, I find this out by trial and error. Sometimes I can get away with a lot and other, other times the technique itself shows its flaws. The takeaway here is that there are limits to what short stacking 
uh, short stack focusing will allow. As you get closer and closer, going from close-up photog photography to what we have to call macro photography, or even closer yet to micro photography, you need more and more precise control, uh, preferably in exact micro increments to get results. Impressionistic short stacking of focus, like we've been discussing, just does, doesn't cut it. We can all be impressionistic. I mean, all photography is impressionistic. But we would need to be more exact than that uh, if we're very, very close. If you look closely at any stacked photo and you know what you're doing, you can find its flaws, however minute. I mean, that's the nature of the beast. And it's just part of the deal when you start using stacking, and especially short stacks. Most of these short stacking flaws are usually forgiven or embraced by the overall enhanced sharpness of the stacked photo, so they don't stand out. But some are glaring and they cause the photo to be rejected. Still others can be fixed in Photoshop easily if they are few, but if they're all over the place, there's not much you can do but enjoy it in the abstract flaws and all, then we really are an impressionist. We're just giving it an idea. Frankly, I'm continually amazed at how well most stack photos work out if you take some care with the original shots. Thank you.